Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Padmashri Gail Sampat, and on behalf of myself and the Berkman Klein Center, I'm pleased to welcome you all to today's seminar. So today's seminar on COVID-19 and inequality of the global in the global south is I'm really pleased to welcome two very eminent panelists here with me today, Dr. Madani Bokartiam, who is the Chief of Health and Nutrition in the Myanmar office of the United Nations Children Fund, and Ms. Yvonne McPherson, who is the US Director of BBC Media Action and the Burton Klein Center affiliate. Before I start, as the moderator, I'd like to begin by offering a few thoughts to structure my discussion and to sort of lead our thoughts on the seminar today. So now the discussion on COVID-19 in the global south, a lot of it has focused on disease vulnerability. And in many cases, as we have seen, there have been low counts because we see younger populations on the continent in Africa, in India and other countries. And there have been immediate and effective responses because of lockdowns that have been imposed. And this has led to protect the overburdened healthcare systems in these countries. And it has also reinforced low infection rates. But what we don't see, and what I think is really important to frame the discussion today, is that such lockdowns, while controlling the spread of the disease, have unforeseen socioeconomic outcomes, and they particularly affect extremely vulnerable groups in these countries, such as women, informal laborers, and other vulnerable groups. To begin with, the lockdowns have left millions of informal laborers without safety nets, homes, and employment. In India, for instance, Around 415 million informal migrant workers were left stranded for weeks without the possibility of returning home. This is a wider phenomenon. It also happened in Dhaka, but it happened in other mega cities in Africa, for example, where 70% of the people are either self-employed or wage employed. Weak global demand has led to supply chain disruptions in all low-income countries in different global value chains, whether you take coffee, you take cut flowers or you take ready-made garments. This picture here is a picture of women who are basically the one million, mostly comprising of the one million workers who lost their jobs in Bangladesh. They gathered on the 16th of April on the streets of Dhaka to actually protest and ask for their wages, which were due to them. The ready-made garment sector in Myanmar is another example where between April and May, more than 25,000 garment workers were already laid off in April, and now more than 60,000 factory workers in Myanmar have lost their jobs. In Africa, we are seeing similar outcomes. The World Bank estimates that sub-Saharan African economies will lose somewhere between 37 billion and $79 billion in output losses in 2020 due to COVID alone. This is because of low demand, weakening global trade, and fragmentation of supply chains on which a large number of uh, people in low-income countries rely for their employment. The region, it's forecasted, could also face a severe food security crisis because agricultural production is going to shrink between 2.6% and 7%, and these will have large repercussions on employment and well-being. So while we talk about socioeconomic disruptions of this nature, what we have to bear in mind is that they have longer term implications for health, well-being, equality, and development. They worsen the particular vulnerabilities of specific groups of people because they already plague on resource-constrained healthcare systems. They constrain access to water, food, and sanitation, which is already constrained and unequally distributed in these countries then they challenge already weakened institutional systems to combat this kind of rising inequality and unemployment. They push back already accomplished victories in eradicating poverty. There's a UN study recently which shows that we might go back 30 years in our struggle for poverty if we do not take on board these kinds of impacts of COVID-19. And they also challenge healthcare in ways that go beyond the infection rate itself. Here on the right side is a very small commentary that I wrote, which has recently been published. It's available, a live link for that on our website as well, on our BKC website for this event. I invite you to look into that, which looks at these issues and takes a much deeper, uh, uh, deeper uh, analysis. But for the purposes of this seminar, 
with this introduction, I would like to first welcome our panelist, Dr. Madani Bokartian, who, as I mentioned to you, is the Chief of Health and Nutrition in the Myanmar Office of the United Nations Children's Fund. He leads UNICEF's support to improve the demand for and access to essential health and nutrition services for women and children, especially those most in need. He will be speaking to us today about his experience in looking at healthcare outcomes after COVID-19 in the field. So Madani, without further ado, I pass on the parole to you. Thank you, Padmashri and fellow panelists and uh, participants. So thanks for this opportunity. Uh, and so what I'm going to do now is really very quickly uh, share some thoughts or uh, facts, I guess, from Myanmar uh, with regards to the impact that COVID-19 has had on the health system there. So I will share my screen now. So this is really just to give you um, an, an overview of how the uh, epidemic has progressed in Myanmar. So on the 4th of Jan, uh, Myanmar was uh, uh, notified by the WHO. And the next day, they started measures to look at um, looking at points of entry and uh, you know, measures in place like temperature screening and so on. And on the 31st of January is when their first pers um, uh, person under investigation was, was detected, meaning uh, having a fever and detected at a point of entry, likely, if I recall correctly, at uh, uh, Yangon International Airport. Now, between end of Jan and late Feb, all testing that was being done in Myanmar was done uh, remotely or uh, was sent to Bangkok because the capacity was not in country. But as of 20 February, uh, Myanmar developed that capacity and um, started testing in-house themselves. Uh, on the 13th of March, just to give you a sense, the National Central Committee to Prevent, Control and Treat COVID-19 was uh, was developed and it was cha is chaired by the state councillor, so Dong Son Tzu Chi. Um, on the 24th of March is when uh, the government imposed 14 days quarantine for incoming travelers from any country, for, from, from a number of countries. Uh, now actually that quarantine is 21 days for people coming in in a, a, a government facility, whether it's a hotel or an actual uh, health facility and another seven days at home. And finally, one other key point is that on the 22nd of April, uh, Myanmar developed its health sector contingency plan, which I will go into in a couple slides. So I just wanted to give you a quick sense of what the, um, um, the dashboard that has been developed by the Ministry of Health looks like. And I'm just going to exit for one second and bring you to that. So hopefully you can see this. Um, and here you see it's a Ministry of Health and Sports dashboard that shows uh, relatively real time that it's updated two or three times a day. Uh, here you can see the latest update was at 8 p.m. Um, on the 26th, which is um, uh, about four hours ago, I would say, or three hours ago. And you can see that there are 206 confirmed cases uh, out of 20,000 tests, which comes up to about a 1% um, positivity, which I guess it is within the range, but um, clearly uh, there's a need for more testing um, because 20,000 tests, uh, if you think about it, is a fairly low number. Um, so let me go back now to uh, my presentation. So, so as I mentioned, the government of Myanmar developed this health sector contingency plan with support from partners. And this plan really aims to help manage uh, uh, in a comprehensive way the health sector response to COVID-19 and gives guidance on priority areas and actions to be uh, taken so that there's an adequate prevention and response to what they would see as a probable community transmission of this virus, uh, which is the, the worst case scenario. Um, five or seven areas of focus are coordination, uh, surveillance, uh, and points of entry, 
looking at national laboratory system and the capacity in that, uh, the clinical management and infection prevention and control, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions such as, you know, um, stay at home orders or closing schools and so on, um, risk communication and logistics and operational support. Now at UNICEF Myanmar, we've taken, we've looked at it in five different ways and how we are supporting the response to the government. The first one is on risk communication and community engagement, where um, it's really important to look at uh, targeted, ensuring that there's targeted and accurate information uh, to mitigate rumors, reduce stigma, and engage communities. Um, the next area of support is around critical supplies for diagnostics and logistical support. Uh, given our, our comparative advantage and our capacity, we have a very large uh, supply um, division in Copenhagen that uh, manages global procurement and has access to global markets. And so that has helped us to help procure PPE and masks and test kits, uh, sanitizers and soap and disinfectants and oxygen concentrators and ventilators. A continued access to critical services. This is where um, you know we have our, our the ability to support, whether it's uh, helping to ensure that there's continued uh, institution institutional delivery, uh, essential newborn care, the treatment for diarrhea and pneumonia, immunization, which I will get into a little bit later, uh, nutrition and water and sanitation. Now, what we can see, given some of the uh, orders, such as the approaches, such as physical distancing, well, that has an impact on a number of services. And so, given that UNICEF uh, has a mandate to look, look also at child protection, well, we're trying to see how we can uh, mitigate the impact on accessing um, child protection services, as well as um, supporting altern alternate alternative systems for continuous learning. And finally, on social science research, um, one thing that we, we are looking at is to try and assess the socioeconomic impact, um, support emergency social protection response, uh, likely potentially piloting a um, health microinsurance scheme and expanding existing cash-based interventions. So broadly, the impact on the health system, what we've seen is that healthcare workers, equipment and facilities have really been reassigned to look specifically at uh, the response for COVID, and whether it's screening at points of entry, uh, contact tracing, collecting samples, um, managing quarantine facilities, and actual facilities, uh, uh, secondary and tertiary level hospitals being repurposed as uh, quarantine facilities. So that we can see how that has a, an impact. A bit of the detail, like in terms of the demand for services, um, of course, the movement restrictions have reduced and, and the reduced public transport um, and quarantine in place orders in some of the townships in the country is really affecting people's access to services. Um, and we know that Myanmar already has a, high, a quite high level of out-of-pocket health expenses. It's above 70% of total health expenditure, which is enormous and one of the largest in the region. Um, we can see how um, the, the perceived risk benefit calculation by individuals uh, deciding to seek care will have an impact on if they actually go to um, uh, seek services. So uh, all of these come into play and in how they have an impact on the demand for services. A way to mitigate that is that the government has set up a COVID-19 hotline where they have medical experts that are doing virtual triage. And so this is really to look at, you know, COVID and non-COVID, and they're able to refer uh, to specific facilities or uh, specific um, uh, interventions. And also for, for nutrition, uh, there are preparations for an infant and young child feeding hotline, recognizing that, that there's an important aspect there. Quickly on service delivery, before COVID, in reality, there was only just over 50% of healthcare worker posts that are filled. So we can see how with all this reassignment and, and prioritization around COVID, how uh, this is having an even greater impact on um, the availability of healthcare work and their, and their ability to provide services. So we've seen some essential uh, reproductive maternal newborn and child health and nutrition services um, reduced or paused. And one example is immunization, which I will get into in a few slides. Um, the reduced or 
no space and higher level referral facilities. As I mentioned, a number of these have been transformed into quarantine facilities. So the ability to refer and uh, for special cases um, has been reduced. There has been a bit of an impact on support to affected uh, internally displaced populations um, uh, in camps due to the movement restrictions. But when it comes to nutrition, what we've seen is that that is less affected because uh, there, those services are mainly delivered by um, camp staff that have been trained. And also um, some, of, some key life-saving services such as the treatment of, of SAM uh, continues and that's uh, what we've observed. On immunization, uh, just very quickly, um, immunization was halted for the months of April and May uh, because again, healthcare workers had to prioritize um, the response to COVID-19. This is uh, resuming on June 1st and has actually resumed at the hospital, uh, love, hospital immunization level uh, since the middle of May. Um, we can see how for immunization, there's an increased risk of VPDs uh, given the, the lower level of coverage, especially in some areas where that are harder to reach and where there, ha there, there has been uh, some outbreaks in the past, such as uh, polio, um, vaccine-derived uh, polio vaccine, uh, polio virus uh, in 2019 in one part of the country. There's a potential decrease in community demand because of um, the, the instructions to avoid mass gatherings and exercise social distancing and also that community fear of infection. Uh, but that being said, we've observed also that there is concern from parents that their children are missing out on their, their immunization and their, there's demand for that as well. There's potential vaccine wastage as you know, the, the multi-dose uh, policy where because of the the, the hiatus, uh, some doses are actually going to be lost because um, they wouldn't be able to be used uh, and, and expire um, during the, the, the break. And finally, a risk of vaccine stockouts because of the limited global uh, uh, and regional transport options. We have not seen that because um, Myanmar has a fairly good buffer, but that is a, a real risk. But this presents an opportunity because what has happened is with the planning for the resumption of routine, routine immunization, uh, there's been a, an, an updated uh, SOP developed and this SOP will puts more emphasis on better hand hygiene and compliance with standards for organized uh, immunize, immunization at the community level. As well, um, the lower level staff are, are better reached through video conferencing and actually getting a lot more instruction that way. And there's a shift also to data collection and reporting through an electronic system, which is much more efficient. On supply chains quickly, the global demand uh, uh, and global supply uh, has been affected. There's been a surge in prices. Um, the largest impact we've seen is for the transport of essential commodities for routine services, given the prioritization of the COVID-19 on key supplies such as PPE and test kits. And in Myanmar, there is a lower buying power and a lower domestic production. So that really just um, is compounded, compounding the, the ability to ensure a steady supply. Uh, and there's little domestic production anyways, and whatever is there is diverted to COVID-19. On communications, uh, what we can say is that uh, in Myanmar, the MOHS Facebook, I mean, Facebook is king in Myanmar much more than anything else. Um, so Facebook is really the platform, the social media platform to reach people. And uh, before COVID, the Ministry of Health website, for example, had only 300,000 page likes, and that dramatically increased uh, more than uh, 10 times uh, uh, as it seems to be now. But that Facebook page is really useful to providing the official statements and communi uh, communication materials, guidance, a lot of that risk communication to the population. Um, so very quickly, you will probably be aware that um, the Lancet just put out uh, a few days back uh, early estimates on the indirect effects of COVID on maternal and child mortality. And looking at the scenarios that they have, if that is applied to Myanmar, what we see is the potential to have 
between 300 and 1400 additional child deaths per month and between 16 and 77 additional maternal deaths per month uh, per month so the potential there is huge uh, and obviously that looks at a mix of coverage and also wasting in, in children under five. So very quickly before I finish, uh, look at a bit at uh, this socioeconomic rapid monitoring that um, we have been doing uh, through another section within UNICEF. Uh, looking at um, the way this has been done is recognizing that, um, you know, as Padma Shri mentioned, beyond the um, public health um, uh, response and impact, we have to really look at the socioeconomic side of things. And the, uh, it's been recognized also by the UN and the UN has put forward a framework to look at um, how to mitigate that impact, uh, given that this is an impact that would affect countries over the, the longer term. And so in order to get a sense of how the, at the household level that um, COVID is having an impact, um, we've identified 120 households that are uh, across the country in some of the more um, uh, vulnerable or affected areas. So a mixture of vulnerability, mixture of actually where there are a, a number of COVID cases, such as Yangon, the capital, um, and uh, a mixture of ethnic backgrounds and a mixture of uh, urban and rural, uh, much more uh, urban than rural, given the what we've seen in terms of the epidemic in Myanmar. The average household size is uh, just over five, and there's an average of about two children in each household. So what we see quickly is that 50% uh, of respondents of the households reported that they were still working. Uh, however, that you know uh, half of those were also uh, reporting that um, there were um, their work situation had changed. So they were still working, but maybe they were doing another job or um, doing two jobs or so on. Um, what we do, what we've also heard from them is that 50% um, of respondents said that products are more expensive um, and that um, about 25% said that products are actually unavailable. So that gives a sense of um, the ability to consume um, or the access to uh, things to consume and um, that where we're seeing a bit of an uh, a bit of an impact. I must preface though that this again is a very small sample It's the first round of four planned rounds. It's a very small um, sample 120 households. So the representativity of this, you know, we're, we're not going to get into that, but this is really to give us a snapshot of what uh, we're seeing. 100% have heard of COVID, which is good. I think that means that uh, the awareness is high and uh, social media plays a big role in that. Um, one thing that uh, we noticed was that um, the household noticed an increase in respiratory disease cases in the last six to eight weeks. Now, whether that is an actual increase or if it's an, um, the fact that uh, households and caregivers are more attuned to what uh, you know, respiratory disease might be because of awareness um, uh, that remains to be seen. If we look at children, 84% um, of children spent their time at home and the vast majority of children spent their time indoors. What we have seen also, it's not here, is that it seems that children are actually happier. So um, spending more time in the home, spending more time with their families and parents and siblings, so uh, uh, somewhat of a positive uh, impact there. Uh, a less positive impact is that 73% of women uh, said that their chores uh, or share of household work had increased. Um, so you can see how um, the stay at home orders and um, the children being at home and so on and the care for children and for family members uh, uh, is a reality. And then lastly, just because I think I'm over time, um, one thing that they looked at is about uh, consumption of, of, in terms of food. 75% um, said that there was no real change in what they ate. And if it comes to breastfeeding of 25 women, uh, 21 said that there was no change in breastfeeding. And um, I think two or three said that um, they, they can't remember exactly, but um, 
the level of change there is not really representative. So not much of a change in breastfeeding. But again, this is a preliminary observation on a small sample um, with a few questions. So we're really looking forward to additional rounds and um, looking at how do we um, gauge this in terms of the, what we can glean from it. And lastly, in terms of child poverty, um, the Myanmar, Myanmar Living Conditions Survey in 2017 um, estimated that 30% um, of children were living in households that were poor. Um, and some modeling was done based on that information, and based on recent information, looking at the fact that when uh, the impact of COVID, if we say that um, there's a reduction in one unit of income. We, the modeling suggests that uh, there isn't a commensurate reduction of one unit of consumption. The modeling says that it's the, that reduction is between 0.2 and 0.35 units. So if we model that according to that 0.2 lower bound and 0.35 upper bound, at a three month lockdown, we see that the level of child poverty would increase from a baseline of 31% to about 40% in a three month lockdown uh, and potentially up to 41.7% in, 41 in a six month lockdown. Now what this is also hiding is that although there is 30% of children that are deemed to be in poor households, there's another 30% that are in the bracket right above which is non-poor and secure. So we can see how that can have a drastic impact in terms of shock to those families that COVID would have. So there's a the sense that um, the level of poverty may, may double um, uh, in, because of COVID. But again, this is modeling that uh, is very preliminary that uh, still requires um, consultation but I thought it would be useful to share uh, as part of this discussion. And so I will leave it at that and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Madani, thank you for that. Um, I was just told, by the way, that uh, my slides didn't show up when I uh, introduced. So apologies for that, slight technical glitch. There were only four slides. The most important part was already written up and thankfully up on a commentary, which is available on our BKC website. So now I will move on to introduce our second panelist, uh, Ms. Yvonne McPherson, who is the US Director of BBC Media Action, the international charity of the BBC to use media and communication for development. Yvonne is also a BBC affiliate and she has been working on covering the Ebola crisis previously and now COVID-19. And she will be talking to us about the impact of COVID-19 on vulnerable groups in the countries that she's been working in. Yvonne, the, the parole is yours. All right, well, thank you all for joining this seminar and thanks to Padmashri for inviting, inviting me to share some observations of how we are seeing the impact of COVID-19 on the communities in the global south that we're interacting with. I work for BBC Media Action, which is the international organization created by the BBC to use media and communication for development and humanitarian response. And why we've been asked to share in this forum is because a big part of our job is to understand the lived realities of the people that we are creating content for. We are producing and disseminating COVID-19 content to millions of people in the Global South. And I'm not going to go into the work that we do, and instead I can share some links of that work in the chat. Um, instead, I want to focus on a bit of a needs analysis and provide some examples that illustrate that vulnerable populations in the Global South face multiple overlapping challenges. We are seeing now how population needs are quickly transitioning from basic communication around prevention, symptoms, treatment, to more complex and nuanced secondary impacts affecting livelihoods, security, psychosocial well-being, and so much more. I've been asked to um, speak about what we're seeing from refugee communities, and here I'll focus on the Rohingya refugees. 
Um, there are about a million of them living in camps in Bangladesh. They have access to the basics, such as food and shelter and limited health care, but they're still extremely vulnerable. Uh, they're exposed to dangers of monsoon elements. Women and children face issues around security and exploitation, and they're completely dependent on aid. The first cases of COVID-19 were just confirmed in the last couple of weeks, and people are naturally worried. Here are some images of the camps. You see makeshift homes with common walls that are packed in, alleyways are narrow, and water and sanitation areas are communal. Standard advice around maintaining physical distancing and washing hands regularly are clearly going to be difficult in this context. Aid agencies and the government has added triage areas in primary care facilities and isolation and treatment centers. And our teams have been working hard to explain the concepts of isolation and quarantine. Um, in the photo on the right, we, um, we showed a video of what an isolation center looks like in order to help demystify the concept. We also track rumors and collect community feedback and perceptions of the Rohingya and the Bangladeshi host community. And we publish these in bulletins like the ones you see here on the screen. And we share these with the community aid, uh, and the humanitarian aid organizations to better orient their activities to respond to the needs and preferences of the communities. And again, I'll put the links to these bulletins in the chat in case you're interested in reading them and we're publishing them um, continuously and regularly. So here's some of the feedback that we've, um, we've gathered recently from some of this feedback mechanism. So first of all, in addition to the fear of the virus, the Rohingya people said that they were concerned about movement restrictions which is preventing them from earning money that they use to supplement the aid they get. Many say that the food aid that they get is not enough to meet their family's needs. And because of these difficulties, they're saying that maintaining hygiene and distancing is not a priority for them right now. Instead, they're just looking for um, scope to earn money. And some have said that they, um, this lack of earning ability is causing an increase in crime um, like robbery. And as um, my co-panelist already said, I mean, the Rohingya and the host community are worried about their children's education. They don't have reliable or any internet or the proper devices that would enable students to work online. And then the other thing I'd like to share is just the sheer kind of fear and stigma that is increasing in these communities. As infection rates increase in Bangladesh, there is growing fear and stigma. And what we're seeing is that in rural communities, this suggests that people are not allowing outsiders to collect water from shared water sources for fear that they may have the virus. So they're sort of hoarding certain common resources. Um, people said that whole families are being ostracized if one of their family members is suspected of being infected, and they could even be told to leave the local area altogether. There was even a case of a community sabotaging the construction site of a proposed temporary hospital for COVID-19 patients. And if this context was not challenging enough, last week a cyclone hit Bangladesh and Eastern India. So Bangladesh is well versed in cyclone preparation, but no one has experience preparing for a cyclone in the time of a global pandemic. So just imagine across Bangladesh, people had to make some tough choices. Um, this is a case where a country facing um, the evacuation of, of nearly 2 million people in the coastal areas into crowded cyclone shelters um, also risks spreading COVID-19. You know, or do they continue to restrict um, physical um, uh, proximity and risk people dying from the storm? 
So we've been working on preparing for natural threats like cyclones in Bangladesh for nearly a decade. And to think that all this work, you know, done by us and the government and other organizations is, you know, potentially undone by COVID, you know, this work to um, um, get people to seek shelter, um, to prepare for a cyclone um, is, is, is potentially undone is disheartening um, because now people just doubt what they should do. Um, though, you know, we are working on materials to help kind of re-message in this area. The cyclone did not hit the area where the refugees are directly, but the camps have been affected by high winds, heavy rains, and flooding, which in turn impacts food production and sanitation. And this will go on as the mon monsoon season in a lot of Asia runs from May to S September. And when we consider the idea of compounding threats on top of vulnerabilities, through our community feedback service for Rohingya, we learned that families feel an added sense of fear and insecurity in the monsoon for unexpected reasons. Yes, there's flooding which impacts livelihoods and sanitation, but there's also insecurity of women and children. We were told that the sound of the heavy rain on the makeshift tented homes makes people fear violence and kidnapping because the sound would mask any calls for help. So during this monsoon, people will be in their homes more because of COVID-19, livelihoods will be threatened, and the fear of crime will increase. And with that, I'll turn to the impact COVID is having on women and girls more generally in the global south. So early data indicates that the majority of rates from COVID-19, the mortality rates for COVID-19 may be higher for men, but the pandemic is having a devastating effect um, socially and economically on women. And it's now very well documented that lockdowns place women at higher risks of domestic violence. This is not specific to the Global South, but generally support services will be lacking. And we're seeing in our sexual and reproductive health projects in places like South Sudan, that there's an increased risk of sexual abuse and unplanned pregnancy with girls who are forced out of school because of the lockdown. Um, Dr. Madani already mentioned the maternal deaths um, that tend to increase during health crises due to the redirection of health resources away from reproductive health care to pandemic containment. Um, we also know that 70% of frontline health workers worldwide are women, putting them at greater risk of COVID-19. Malnutrition among women and girls can also increase as a result of reduced household income and disrupted food supply chains. Um, in our data from Bangladesh, again, um, in the rural areas, it's quite common for women to feed the, their husbands and the male members of their family first and wait to eat before they have their own meal. And many women have told us that there just isn't enough food left for them to eat. In countries where adolescent pregnancy and marriage are common, we know that temporary school dropouts often mean, um, often become permanent for girls as they take on new roles, such as caring for children, the sick, the elderly. And then finally, UN reports that with nearly 60% of women around the world um, who work in the informal economy, um, many of them are experiencing the economic shocks um, as a result of the pandemic, and we can talk more about those. But at the same time, their unpaid care work is increased as a result of school closures and the elevated needs of older people. I mean, these are just just a few examples of how the pandem pandemic is impacting women and girls and refugees. And I hope what I've done is to highlight the fact that for so many vulnerable communities in the Global South, they have to contend with multiple and complex challenges all at one time. And for many of these challenges, the solutions are not simple. Um, this has Im implications for the global community, um, which I hope we can unpack in the discussion. Um, but one thing that is critical in all of this is that the health and the humanitarian aid sector needs to listen constantly, involve, and respond to the needs of the people that they're trying to serve. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, thank you. So. Um... From both of you, I hear certain common themes, and I think these are really important. 
So one common theme is that health and socioeconomic challenges, they compound each other. What we see in the case of COVID-19 is really an enhancement of certain poverty and impoverishment routines, which can have very serious impact on children's health and in this case, refugees and women's health outcomes, Yvonne. And I, I now see one question here from Amy Lee. And this question is about, yeah, well, I mean, I, it's a comment actually. So, um, but before, before we get to the point, I would like to actually, before we get to other questions, I'd like to ask the two panelists to reflect on something. From the work that you've been doing, do you really see how the global community could help more? Do you see you know, parallels between what you've been doing and broadly in other countries where you have colleagues working? What can we do more and how can we actually get policy and global policy to bring to bear on these interlinkages between socioeconomic challenges of COVID-19 and healthcare outcomes? Ladies first. <laughs> okay, sure. Yes, um, there were a lot of sub questions in there. And yeah, I also wanted to just acknowledge the uh, comment of Amy Yi um, that absolutely um, the Bangladeshi government has been doing cyclone preparedness for decades. And, um, and, it's a, and, and cyclone preparedness is very well entrenched among the Bangladeshi community. Um, so, so yes, I just wanted to agree with that wholeheartedly. And, um, but what I was trying to illustrate was that um, this has never happened before in a global pandemic. So we, um, we've all had to rethink how to do this. Um, you know, the government, but also agencies that are used to supporting the government to prepare for cyclones. But I thank you and very much agree with your point. Uh, coming to your question, Padma, about um, about what the the international community can be doing better. Um, when I can speak more to the issue of communication and the provision of information, and an observation that I have is that um, oftentimes there's an expectation that um, something is created centrally by an international organization in the global north and then just disseminated to the global south. And, um, you know, we often get this suggestion from, from people who support our work to just make it once and then translate it into lots of languages. And we're constantly having to push back on that idea that there's just this one size fits all communication for everybody and hand washing, you know, means the same thing to everyone. I mean, that's such a classic example where it doesn't. And so every piece of communication needs to be completely grounded in the context of the people that need to know about that 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 particular health message or uh, piece of communication. And, um, and so we need to be much more thoughtful and deliberate about um, involving the very communities that we're trying to communicate in to understand what their information needs are, um, to have them involved in the creation of this content so that it's culturally relevant, um, that the linguistic idioms are correct, um, because something that is produced in northern Europe and disseminated you know in Southeast Asia for example is is really not going to resonate um, we've seen examples where um, we have images of hand washing you know from sinks and a, and a lot of the people that we reach um, don't have um, running water in their homes um, they get water from communal pumps so those kinds of representations, I think, are important to make sure that they're relevant. Absolutely. Thank you, Yvonne. Madani? Yeah, maybe just to touch on that last point that Yvonne mentioned is, you know, the different levels of education and literacy. Um, I think within Myanmar, uh, on top of that, we also have a, a fair number of different ethnic groups. So. Uh, it's different cultural realities, it's different levels of literacy. And so what we have tried to do is to, you know, support the government in preparing a lot of this risk communication that is tailored to a particular uh, community. So we have, we've helped them develop uh, standard hand washing messages and so on in, I think, 80 different languages. 
So, um, you know, it's about tailoring for the community to make sure the message gets across, uh, leaving no one behind, really focusing on the ones that are hardest to reach. And so a strong part of our focus has been, you know, looking at some of those areas that are harder to reach, be they geographically harder to reach because they're more remote or socially harder to reach because of those differences, as I mentioned, in literacy or, or um, access to, to, to services. So that's one area we've looked at. And we're working also through local organizations to reach some of these communities because some of those communities the government can't reach. Uh, so it's really about how do we ensure that those key services are still able to reach the most vulnerable. Um, a couple other points. Um, the UN has, I mean, again, COVID-19 is a public health emergency, but it's leading to a socioeconomic emergency. Um, the impact is immense uh, in terms of the, the, the like countries are moving back in their development. I think the, the Human Development Report just came out, uh, COVID-19 and Human Development Report, which is showing that for the first time since 1990, development, uh, there, there's, it's showing a, a backtrack. So it's clearly having a major impact on the broader development uh, lens. And so how can we support governments that are gradually recognizing this is uh, the UN has developed a framework to look at how do we support the addressing the impact of the, the socioeconomic impact of COVID. And so all the UN is coming together at country level to look at all the key areas, the different pillars, be it health, itself how do we help the government to improve strengthen its system use this opportunity of covid to expand and accelerate the strengthening of the system all the different pillars be it looking at the you know social protection um how do we support that in in the covid19 context and beyond uh, nutrition uh you know nutrition is so multi-sectoral that it's, it's about agriculture, it's about private sector, it's about education, it's about social welfare. So how do we bring all that together uh, to support m nutrition from a multi-sectoral angle and ensure that you know, the food system actually is able to cope and respond and not mm -hmm. suffer from this because you know, we're seeing that, uh, the, the, the potential that that can have. So this, framework that the UN has developed, and there's a few other pillars, and we'll get into them, uh, is really designed to bring the UN together for this unprecedented uh, situation in how do we support various countries in looking at this as an opportunity to advance and strengthen systems and look, look at the short term, look at the COVID response, but with the thought of what are the longer term um, changes? That we can changes do? And I think Ebola started to do that in West Africa, where many of the big donors there, be it the UK or US and, and, Europe, and countries in Europe, looked at that as an opportunity. But I'm not sure to what extent that has actually led to changes um, within the systems in West Africa, the, the countries that were affected. So we're hoping we can learn from that and, and ensure that you know, this is a massive opportunity. There's massive amounts of resources. There's a lot of generosity. You know, the UN Secretary General has called about global solidarity. How can countries that are already affected in the global north also continue to support countries that are affected in the global south that require that support? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Megani. So I've, we've got a number of questions here. A couple of them are very similar. So I'm going to try and paraphrase that for both of you to sort of uh, respond to. I think one important question, which is also something that, that comes up more frequently in my work is, what is the role of the internet in each of these contexts in terms of promoting communication, improving healthcare outcomes, in trying to understand the socioeconomic challenges of COVID-19 in different contexts and remote work. For instance, what I find is that we tend to look at the lower rates of infection and assume that these countries are not as much affected, whereas really the impact is felt elsewhere. And that's, that's, that's the, which is the topic of the seminar, but I would like both of you to, to try and reflect on, on, on something like that. 
<laughs> Am I on your left in the screen? <laughs> uh, very quickly, obviously, the role of the internet. As I mentioned in my presentation, um, social media is massive in Myanmar. Um, you know, Myanmar went from uh, no cell phones to smartphones. Um, so we can, and Facebook has become king. Nothing beats Facebook. So Facebook is really the medium to reach the masses. Um, and so, you know, recognizing this, I think Facebook has also played a big role in supporting a lot of countries in this region, giving them ad credits to facilitate the um, pushing of information to the masses, but very importantly, also trying to make sure that misinformation is managed, that stigma is not something that uh, continues, but also a lot of the the fake news, make sure that's taken care of, but a lot of the, the impact that, um, how should I say, uh, the bullying, online bullying as well. Because we've seen that health work care workers are are being ostracized in some communities because they see, there's the fear of them being infected and bringing the infection to the community. Um, Myanmar has a lot of migrant workers, so Myanmar nationals living abroad in Thailand or China coming back, and they are also have been uh, discriminated against so it's about how do you ensure that the population is, their awareness is raised. One thing that we've done also is we have an interesting platform called the You Reporters. Uh, and that is basically a, um, a, a roster of youth that are connected and that we can work with them to push a lot of questions. And so we get a nice sample and um, kind of check from them about whatever topic you want. And it's a platform that is there. And we've used that to reach out to youth across the country to ask, okay, what is COVID? How do you contract it? Just to kind of check, fact check on their awareness, but also you can use that platform to put out questions. And, and so that's a platform that has been quite helpful. Um, one last thing I wanted to say is uh, on the, maybe it's not about the internet, but uh, Yvonne mentioned about uh, the increase in vulnerability of, of women and children in this COVID context, be it um, uh, abuse and so on. So what has happened in Myanmar is that they've, we've actually helped the government put in place um, a mental health and psychosocial support hotline. So anyone can call in, uh, it's free to call in. They can call in and, and, and ask for support and uh, speak to um, experts to say, okay, this is my situation. So you have to find virtualize or digitize that the kind of support they would have received in a safe space or uh, another environment. And that is something that is being put in place. So using the digital, obviously it's becoming an, a new norm. Um, and in Myanmar, I think that uh, with the leap that Myanmar has had on the use of the internet and um, that technology, I think it's an area that uh, there's a, lot, a huge potential over. Thank you. There's one question that, that really nicely uh, sort of like follows from this in the, in the Q&A. So we have a question saying, um, how are digital technologies being used in Myanmar and Bangladesh to, to tailor the public health response? especially digital contact tracing or immunity certificates coupled with digital in identity initiatives, which are being introduced in many parts of the world. Do you see something similar happening in your context? And if there are, are there privacy safeguards that you observe? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, if I can quickly, Myanmar does have a, an app that they've set up um, for contact tracing. And I mean, it's anchored in transparency and anchored in uh, respect of uh, data and so on. So that's something that is being used. I mean, Myanmar is, has really taken this response seriously. Um, the contact tracing is of a, a, a technical level that uh, is, you know, of a, of a global north. Um, they each and every, um, suspected or confirmed case, there's a very meticulous contact tracing that's done to go back and identify um, potential contact points. Um, so 
you know, I think that technology is there and it's being used and there are, there are no reported concerns around uh, sec in, in security of information uh, for those individuals, over. Great. The, one more question I think which is really interesting for this panel to consider is, um, I mean, it's from Leon, Leo Cortana of BKC, which, and his question is, the current pandemic has blurred some of the lines in the divide between the global south and the north, and how do institutions like the UN or BBC Media Action work at balancing these perception and sharing best practices or campaigns or solidarity networks coming from the global south and clearly challenging the global north kind of status quo? You're on my right, so I'll go to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'm wondering if I could just make a couple of points about the the internet as well and because I think there were a couple of questions directed to me on that too and wanted to acknowledge that um, you know how important the the internet and you know platforms like Facebook and other social media platforms are in being able to see what people are talking about and um, and understand what the information needs are and what the misinformation is and so part Part of our um, misinformation and rumor tracking is to um, keep an eye on social media and then that helps us to understand what people are saying and maybe what um, false news needs to be corrected and to point people to more reliable sources of information. And we had a question from Sergio mentioning WhatsApp, which is you know, such a critical platform, um, that and other messaging apps, because again, we know they're very popular among the populations that, that we work with. And, um, and we know that that's a place where misinformation can spread very quickly. Um, so it's something that, um, that we're looking at as well. But um, for the Rohingya specifically, so they, are, um, they don't really have great access to the internet. In fact, it was, um, their, their access is, is restricted. Um, so we are having to rely on, um, on the community itself and some leaders in the community. Um, but I wanted to speak to another great question uh, related to this, which was around research and how research is changing in the time of COVID. It's such a great question because we rely so much on being able to interact with, um, with our community-based organization partners and the community members themselves. And, um, and now we can't physically go and meet them and ask them questions and interact with them. Mm -hmm. And so we are having to rely on more electronic ways of um, connecting and getting information, getting this two-way information. Uh, communication channel established and so that might be everything from SMS surveys um, that uh, people can can use even on dumb phones um, and in fact we relied on that when we were responding to the um, Ebola crisis in West Africa um, so we've begun to pick up some of these alternative research practices um, because of the challenges of COVID and in fact, my colleague who's our head of research has just written a blog on how to conduct research in the time of COVID. So you can see that on our website if you want to learn more about that. Okay. I think we still did not answer the question on the lessons from this crisis for That's a tough the one. global north and the global south and where we sort of see things to share. I think that, I mean, there's, there, is, there is similarities between the kinds of things that we observe for low-income groups in the United States right now, for instance, and what we are seeing in terms of the outcomes for low-income groups in, in, in countries of South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, and so on. And I think that, uh, I mean, the, there's, there's, there's clearly a need for, for sharing best practices and trying to evolve global policy responses, which really tackle those that are excluded. And um, so I want, to, I want to invite both of you to, to reflect on that and, and maybe share some thoughts. I can quickly share. I mean, if we look at how the pandemic has progressed, um, the global north has 
in a way, um, reacted a little bit late uh, in terms of some of the, the, the non-pharmaceutical interventions that could have been taken to, I guess, help to try and mitigate the, the, the start and the, the expansion of the infection in the various countries. Whereas if you look at Africa and other parts of the, the world, I think perhaps they had a little bit more time to learn about the, 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 the potential of not taking certain measures quickly. So, you know, uh, you look at many countries in Africa, the, the fact that they in general have put in place measures earlier um, you know, I saw an article the other day that was saying that that is the reason why, or one of the main reasons why Africa has been less impacted. Yes, there's the issue of testing and um, ramping up testing to a certain level, but um, I think there's a lot to learn there um, from the global south in terms of their ability to, to respond relatively quickly. I mean, there are obviously ex exceptions of some countries where uh, the leadership is is uh, seems to be in denial about uh, what needs to be done, um, and then the testing. I think you know we've seen a number of countries, whether it's you know South Korea and other countries that have really taken things seriously and ramped up testing uh, as a measure to um, you know test treat test uh, trace treat. You know like they've really taken that approach and we see the impact that, that has had. So, um, you know, there's a lot to learn from the Global South in terms of this pandemic and how uh, it has um, progressed. And um, I think someone would need to maybe take a look at that and put those ideas on paper. No, uh, you're absolutely try and right. con yeah. contrast the, the, the approaches. No, you're um, absolutely what, right. What we're doing as UNICEF is we're, we're trying to put out you know, these uh, at the local level um, celebrate successes and celebrate kind of initiatives um, that are happening. And we've helped, for example, to set online training for healthcare workers on infant and young child feeding. Uh, you know, IYCF training is something that's really done at the community level and with a, a, a group of um, uh, midwives and mothers and it's really kind of hands-on and how do you do that in an environment where you know there's physical distancing so you know we've helped devise ways to do that and we're helping the government to kind of tweak their guidelines a bit so that you know we're still able to make sure that those essential services are, are continued. Yeah yeah and living with the disease that's still circulating outside I think the south really knows how to do that so there is really a lot to learn from the South in this case. So we are a bit over time and um, I'm really, really uh, thankful to all of you for the questions and for being indulgent with us. So um, if my two panelists have nothing more to add, no, okay. <laughs> I definitely, I wanted to answer that question too. <laughs> if they don't have nothing more to add, which they don't apparently, so I no, would like to- do. I would love to add something if oh, I Oh, you would love to, oh yeah, yeah. okay, sorry. Yes, you want, the please. The global north yes. and south question, because I think it's yes. a great question. Right. Um, and and I, I think I, I risk a little bit being on a soapbox with, with my answer, um, but I'll try to be quick, um, which is um, maybe from the media perspective is what we've seen in the global north is that there is a, that people are accessing news media, information media during this time, right? Because during a crisis, everyone needs to know what's happening. Um, and um, similarly, in the global south, um, people need access to trusted local sources of information and local media. And so I suppose this is a bit of a plug from me on the um, what's happening to local media in so many countries in the global south, which is um, they're um, not being able to survive financially. And it is so important that 
We have local media to hold governments to account, to hold the international AIDS sector to account, which includes a lot of Global North organizations that are in these countries, you know, um, responding to the um, to the crisis. Um, I think a, a med a media can be a great uh, accountability mechanism and a place for local voices to be heard. And um, and so I, I think that there needs to be um, some more attention paid to supporting independent media in, in, in all countries. Thank you, Yvonne. I think we have still one open question and I mean uh, for Yvonne that is, and, um, but um, I'm really aware that we are running out of time. We are almost seven minutes over time. So Yvonne, would you like to take a quick 30 second stab at this or do you Is it the one about GBV? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, great. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we have, we work on the issue of gender-based violence even pre-COVID. Um, so um, what we do is we try to understand what are the drivers of gender-based violence, what are some of the norms, and then we'll create content that challenges a general acceptance of certain levels of violence within families. Um, so challenging some norms and then also promoting discussion, um, getting experts and people who are trusted. These could be religious leaders or other leaders in the community who can talk about it um, in, a, in a supportive way. And so, so much of it is just about bringing the topic to the fore and, um, and having it um, and having people who, um, who people trust to talk about it and to speak against it and to help really shape and influence um, some norms around around general acceptance of, of gender-based gender -based violence, and then where possible to point people to resources and help. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I'd like to end by thanking you all for joining us at BKC. And I want to particularly thank my two panelists here, um, Yvonne and Madani, who joined us all the way from Myanmar, uh, despite the time difference. So thank you both. And for all the participants, I want to, 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 uh, to invite you to visit our events page after a few days where the presentations will be live. And you know, if you have additional questions, you can always contact us and we will have the, uh, the recording of this event live. So, and I would like to thank the BKC events team, uh, Ruben, Megan and colleagues for making this so wonderful. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, yeah, okay, with that, um, so goodbye, goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you, Padma Shri and Yvonne as well, and uh, for the opportunity. It was a great opportunity. Thank you.